Yeah, well, good uh, morning or afternoon, whatever we want to call it. So yeah, as was said, my name is David Havlin, and I'm with the University of California Cooperative Extension. So I'm actually uh, part of the University of California system, um, but I'm based in Bakersfield. So at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, which puts me right in the heart of blossoming sharpshooter territory. Um, yeah, I cover all commodities. I've been doing this for about 20 years. And glassing sharpshooter is just one of many invasive pests that we've had in the area. Now, the invitation I got was to give an overview to this pest. I'm not going to go into super detail, um, but the perspective I'm going to try to give is, you know, what information would I want to know if I were somewhere that didn't have glasswing sharpshooter, but were concerned about it? So uh, that's the angle I'm gonna take. Um, as was said, please you know, note any questions you have along the way, type them into the chat. Uh, we've got a, a, a relatively small group here, uh, meaning that uh, dialogue should be really easy. Uh, we can take care of um, you know, as a group or individually uh, as we go on here. So just to start out, let's see here. There we go. Um, so starting out with Glasswing Sharpshooter, uh, this is actually a, a relatively, actually quite large leafhopper. Uh, it's in the family Cicadelity. And just as an overview, you know, more than 100 ornamentals. It's actually hundreds of ornamentals uh, that it feeds on. Lots and lots of weeds. Dozens and dozens and dozens of plant families that serve as hosts. Um, I'm going to talk a lot today about citrus and grapes because that's the two that are most relevant in my area. Um, but, you know, this is just, it's throughout pretty much, um, you know, any commodity it can feed on. Uh, it has a couple generations per year. And the case study I'll be talking about today is that it likes to overwinter in the citrus, and then it moves into the grapes. Uh, there's two generations, they go back and forth. Uh, but we see the same kind of interactions between different ornamentals within landscapes, um, you know, coastal climates, crop mixes, and you see different uh, now, the, the issue here is that the glasswing sharpshooter feeds in the xylem, uh, so that's where the water is transported through the plant, and it spreads diseases caused by a bacteria that lives in the xylem, which is called xylella fastidiosa. That's why we care. So a little more, a little more about the insect itself as far as identification. Um, so as I said, it's very large, so a half an inch. Uh, you know, if you kind of measure what a half an inch looks like, um, that's pretty darn big for a leafhopper. The adults have this brownish to black color. Uh, if you look from the top, it's it's you know mostly brown black. If you look at the or both pictures, you can also see there's a white spot on the wing. Um, those are called brocosomes. Uh, that's only on the female when she's about to lay eggs. Um, she'll actually lay eggs and kind of rub that white uh, the substance from that white uh, circle off and cover the egg mass with it. Uh, but the abdomen, if you look at the top here from the side, you can see a sort of whitish coloration on there. And the rest of the in insect has a sort of um, yellow, orangish underside. Um, some of the, one way to identify it compared to other sharpshooters, I'm not sure what sharpshooters you have up in the Washington area, uh, but we have others besides glassy wing uh, and examples of smoke tree sharpshooter. And you can just see that the, uh, you know, the head looks different there. Uh, we've got sort of the circular pattern on the top one for glassy wing, more of a striped on the smoke tree at the bottom. Uh, but again, um, you know, you'd have to look at what other sharpshooters in your area to tell them apart. Uh, but identification, I mean, you walk up to a plant and you just look at it. It's huge compared to other leaf hoppers. Uh, it's kind of a no-brainer that that's what it is. Uh, there, there really are very few lookalikes. Now, the nymphs, you know, they're a little more difficult because they're not as ornate. Uh, they've got this olive gray color. Um, they've got bulging eyes, and they'll pass through several instars, just like any other leafhopper nymphs. Uh, and you can see how they kind of hug the plant. If you look at the middle picture, um, yeah, yeah, I'll just have you look at it. So the picture, right in the middle of the body between the legs, you can probably see that little projection sticking out um, between the leafhopper and the stem there. Uh, that's the mouth part. Okay, so the, the mouth part is a straw-like sucking mouth part. That's what it's going to use to tap into the xylem. And, um, you know, because of how that mouth kind of sticks out under the bottom of the body and isn't that long, they really do hug uh, close to whatever they're on. Now the eggs uh, bedded in the underside of the leaf uh, in the epidermis. Usually there's about 8 to 12 at 20 or more sometimes. 
So what you're looking at the picture there is a new and an old egg mass. So the new egg mass there, you can see the green surface. Uh, there's probably a dozen eggs light up side by side. Take that green epidermis of the leaf off and look inside, bottom picture. Um, you can see each one of those vertically is an egg. That little red spot, that's going to become an eye, okay? It's an eye spot is what we call that. Now, as the egg gets older, uh, the cuticle kind of turns brown. So the top picture, you can see that brown left egg mass. Being able to recognize that is actually valuable. Uh, in a lot of animals, you get the egg mass, eggs hatch out, but that brownish leftover egg mass case, if you want to call it, um, it'll stay there for months and months and months. So sometimes uh, the shark is gone, but if you're looking for masses that are left over, you can tell that they, and then of course you harder to see if the insect is around because you know it's somewhere. Uh, the other thing that's nice about the egg masses is to monitor parasitism. So I'll, um, here's a picture. Uh, there are some egg parasitoids that attack it. They'll sting each of the eggs individually. And instead of getting a sharpshooter to come out, you'll get an adult parasitoid coming out. And you can see most of these, the parasitoid came out the top side, a couple that came out the bottom side of the egg. Um, but likewise, you know, that leftover egg mass there with the parasitism holes, it'll sit there for months on the leaf. And so you can just kind of come along and say, number one, hey, sharpshooter's here. But number two, hey, look, these all got parasitized. So it's pretty cool. Now, the name sharpshooters comes from uh, their behavior, where they line up. Uh, you can see this, a, a picture of a grapevine. This is actually from my backyard, um, in the little arbor I've got back there. You can see them all lined up. They sort of hug the host. But you can also see they line up um, parallel to um, uh, the shoot itself. So they don't stand sideways. Uh, I think part of that's just the way they tap into the xylem. You know, xylem runs from roots to tip. And as that water moves up and down, uh, if you've got a sharpshooter mouth part and you tap in, it's uh, it's probably a little bit like being in a fire hydrant. Um, for us, you know, we're typically 100, we average about 100 degrees every day for three months in the summer. And when you get these sharpshooters with that kind of evapotranspiration, with that kind of heat, there's a lot of water to the plant. And so they just, yeah, tap inside and, and drink it. Now, the, the sharpshooter, you know, of course, its name is kind of this hugging against the branch behavior it has. But also, they're really quick to swing around the backsides. So, for example, this picture is kind of a trick picture. Normally, I wouldn't be able to get this. Um, if I were to walk up with a camera and look at this shoot, those sharpshooters would see me. And really quickly, they'd do a little side scoot zoop, right around the backside of the stem. And I wouldn't be able to see any of them. So to get this picture, what I did is I put my camera up, stayed back a little bit with the zoom put my hand forward underneath the plant and kind of move my hand around a little bit. So now they all got scared because they saw my hand underneath the chute and they all ran around to the top, which allowed me to take the picture. So it makes it a little tricky monitoring sometimes because they do hide behind whatever they're on. Ergo, sharpshooters. Now they have a lot of host plants, but they really do have some favorites. Um, this is just a list out of the University of California's Pest Management Guidelines. You know, acacia, avocado, you know, eucalyptus, a very common, um, a very common plant here. Uh, citrus, crepe myrtles. They love grapes, absolutely love grapes. Uh, photinia, potosporum, hibiscus, periwinkles, uh, xylosma, likewise, they love, but hundreds of others. Now, they don't just sit on one host. There's something nutritionally where they like to switch. And you'll see in one place in the morning, they'll move to something else in the afternoon, and they'll just go back and forth between them. Um, certainly something is related to nutrition. Uh, it also relates to, to hydration status in the plant. Find a wilting plant, they're not there. Super hydrated, just watered, watered it plant, you'll find them there. Uh, also note that the reproductive and hosts sometimes are different. Um, even in my own backyard, uh, there's plants I'll see them feeding on all day, uh, like, a, like a xylosma or photinia. But then when I'm looking for egg masses, they're over in the grapevine leaves. Um, the other thing is seasonality, they'll move. So a good example is citrus in the winter, grapes in the summer. Um, you know, obviously if you're a sharpshooter, you're not gonna, you're gonna prefer something uh, that's got leaves on it 
that actually has evapotranspiration going on and water movement during the winter as compared to something that's completely dormant. Now, biological control is important for this pest. Uh, mainly, we're talking about egg parasitoids. So um, these egg parasitoids live uh, throughout the year um, in southern United States, Mexico, Central America. Um, Sharpshire does really well in Haiti. It's an Easter Island uh, off the Chilean coast. In those areas that have more tropical, uh, moderate climates, uh, there's parasitism all year long. Uh, it can be very good. Um, in the areas where I am, the sharp or the parasitoids don't survive the winter very well. And part of that is because the glassing sharpshooter overwinters as the adult. So if if we've got months or so in the winter that all we have is adults, that's not very good for if, um, that's not a good sign if you're an egg parasitoid. So overwintering survival, very difficult. Uh, but they do get started in the spring with the first generation. And by the time we get to the second generation of eggs that we're going to start seeing in a few weeks here, 90% um, of parasitism is very common in urban areas. Um, of course, typically less than that in agricultural areas just because of the pesticides being used, uh, including organic orchards. Um, you know, things like pyganic and entrust um, also affect parasitoids. Now, we do have some very significant mass marine and release programs in California from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And those mainly target urban areas uh, just to keep those parasitism levels high in areas that we don't want to go in and, and use pesticides um, as compared to a, a commercial farm where there's, there's more options um, if pesticides are needed. Um, but, you know, it's not cheap and you know, this isn't a phytus or, or let's say some widespread parasitoid that you can just mass produce by the, the millions for very cheap. Um, they're in the relatively expensive category such that we make what we can and, and target those. Uh, the other thing is getting sharpshooter eggs isn't super easy. And so, um, you know, it's not like a predatory mite that you can just rear on mites or, you know, something that's simple like a lacewing or a, a ladybugs or something. Um, here's the two main parasitoids we have around. It's a gonotosser species, uh, Eshmidae. You can see the male and female on the left, and then the gonotosser's morali on the right side, male and female. Now, these uh, some of these are, are native. At the same time, there's been a lot of searching that's gone on uh, through south southeastern United States, you know, in Florida, for example, uh, as well as you know, Argentina and, and some other places where uh, this pest is known to be, uh, to bring in uh, different parasitoids, but also different strains of parasitoids that perhaps would be better adapted to glasswing sharpshooter than our native ones. Now, monitoring for glasswing sharpshooter. Uh, this right here kind of <laughs> sort of tell-all picture of what you would see throughout much of California. So out in commercial agriculture, we typically use what you'd, you probably know as a white fly trap, like a greenhouse white fly trap. It's this yellow sticky card. You typically put it on a bamboo pole, uh, quarter mile grids. You'll see this in California anywhere you've got citrus, anywhere you've got grapes. Um, you know, up and down the valley. These get checked every one weeks, and you can actually see the glass sharpshooters on there. You can see how big they are. Um, you know, see them from, from quite a, you, like you can literally drive your car down the street, look out your window at these cards, and you can tell if there's sharpshooters on them with very, very little training. So, good. Now, the side is, is this really attractive person? Um, yes and no. So, by that is there's no pheromone, uh, there's no lure, there's no attractant that's going to cause the sharpshooter to intentionally try to fly there. Uh, we do kind of call it a blunder trap. At the same time, the yellow is somewhat attractive to them. You know, if you were to put a white card or, you know, other some other colored card up there, you wouldn't get as many. So some attractiveness, but not a ton. So because of that, you do need to use a fair number of traps and, and put them out in grids. Now, a couple other, oh, and, and one other point to make on this, um, I don't know if you noticed, but you can see the, the grape shoots right there in um, uh, the trap. Uh, those are actually Pierce's disease symptoms. So, so those are glasswing sharpshooters on a sticky trap in a vineyard right next to the cane of a vine that has Pierce's disease symptoms. Uh, that's exactly what we do not want, um, but what can happen. Now, other methods for sampling. 
Um, so visual surveys, you just go around, look for them. Uh, that's really common in ornamental situations. So uh, nurseries, for example, that are going to produce ornamentals that they're going to ship uh, outside of quarantine zones throughout the state. Um, that's just to go around, look, see what you can find. And then we also use tap sampling. So if you want to get nymphs or um, let's say large trees, um, let's say a citrus tree, what take a, a oversized bucket, you sort of stick it into the canopy um, with the, uh, you know, with an upward, a piece of pipe, something, you know, put the net up on foliage, bam, bam, next foliage, bam, next foliage. And you just walk around the tree as fast as you can, putting the net under the foliage and wow. Uh, it's great if you're just going on, let's say, shrubs in a Walmart park um, or just, yeah, ornamental plantings uh, and that kind of thing. You can cover a lot of ground really quickly. The sharpshooters just fall into the net and then you just dump it out and take a look. Um, that is, of course, again, the best method for nymphs. Um, you know, certain times of the years when there are no adults, surveying for nymphs is all you can really do. Uh, the traps, of course, do not collect nymphs. Uh, so here's what one of those sticky cards would look like up close. Um, again, you can see rather large insect. Um, for whatever reason, they never seem to land on their feet. Uh, when you see them on their cards, they're always just kind of laid on their side. They kind of get a little greasy. It looks like they kind of rolled around a little bit in the stickum that's on the card. But again, there's really very little you would confuse a glass wing sharpshooter with. Um, just you can see the size, you can see the bulging eyes, the brownish, you can see the white on the side of the body. Uh, the wings have a little bit of a reddish tinge to them. If you see one kind of separated from the body, um, very few lookalikes. Now distribution. So this is a um, that's a, a a figure from a document that CDFA, uh, actually the Pierce Degree Pierce Disease Control Program through CDFA put out in 2018. Uh, this is the map in California as of 2017. Uh, it's not current because it's from 2017, but it is current. Um, by that, I mean glasswing sharpshooter distribution is pretty stabilized within California. So on the left, that was 2002. You can see it um, within a few years of getting introduced. It just went all throughout Southern California and then up the coastal area up in you know Santa Barbara, Ventura, uh, that climate. And then it jumped over into the Central Valley. So if you look at the picture on the right, there's that little blue area that sticks up. So that, right, what that means is over the mountain range. Okay, if you ever come to Bakersfield and driven to Los Angeles, you're familiar with the grapevine. Yeah, you're driving south in the valley, and then you have to go up and over the mountain range that's running east to west uh, before you drop into LA. That mountain range runs east to west right where you see the, the blue to green change. So that little blue that's um, that's up in the valley, and that strand is, I'm going to call it the 500 to 900 foot elevation range. So when we get higher elevation than that, it's really too cold for a glass wing sharpshooter. When we get lower elevation than that, uh, likewise, we get inversions and sometimes prolonged periods with fog that the sharpshooter doesn't do well in during the winter. Um, so, so in the Central Valley, it's kind of got its favorite places. Now, those blues, that, that's where it is. It's there. It's permanent. We're never going to eradicate it. It loves it there. Uh, the rest of the state that you see with green, it's just got a bunch of little satellite populations. So, you know, Glassman Sharpshire will show up in a city farther north. It gets found. Efforts to eradicate it. Another satellite, efforts to eradicate. So those little satellite populations are popping up yeah, all the time. We always have quarantines. We're always trying to eradicate it somewhere. Really, the program in California is keep it south, push it south, you know, keep, uh, keep trying to knock back that advancing front as it tries to move up the Central Valley and up the coast. Now, here's a, so here's the climate match model. Uh, this is from Gutierrez and, and Ponte from 2013. And you can see the, the red there 
Uh, this really is a tropical insect. So it loves Mexico, loves Central America, loves Southern Florida, loves Baja California. Now, where I am in California is that uh, light blue strip that you would see to the Western half of California. Um, so that blue merits a two and a half on the scale. I'm not quite sure what that means, uh, but that two and a half, sharpshooters love that two and a half, okay? No concerns at all. So looking at the state of Washington, you sort of have uh, east, central eastern, I'm not sure how you, you refer to it, um, but you can see it's a very similar color. So, you know, what's the climate match for glasswing sharpshooter in the state of Washington? I'm going to say you absolutely will have places that are too cold. It's just not going to survive. It's not going to make it through the winter. But you've got places there, particularly on the eastern side of Washington, uh, that there's a good enough match that I would expect it to be able to be established, um, you know, to be just fine, you know. Will you get tens versus thousands? I don't know, um, but rightfully so, this pest should be on your radar screen. Um, you know, there's enough of a climate match in certain areas of the state uh, that there should be concern. Now, why do we care about glasswing sharpshooter? So I'm gonna jump into the, the Pierce disease side of things now. So glasswing sharpshooters spread diseases caused by Xylella fastidiosa. This picture right here is, uh, this is sort of what set it off. So around the year 2000, glasswing sharpshooter got into the area in Southern California called Temecula. It's a wine growing, uh, kind of boutique wine grape growers down there. Um, I'm not sure how many acres it is, but it's, it's tens of thousands of acres. It's not a lot. And uh, glasswing sharpshooter got there. Uh, Xylella fastidiosa was native to the area. And you put the disease and the new vector together, and all of a sudden you had vineyards that looked like this picture, major panic, all the news outlets, LA Times, um, you know, uh, pictures of the vineyards being pushed out because of this nasty new disease. Now, glass from sharpshooter, when you talk to the epidemiologists, they'll tell you it's not an efficient vector. So as far as, you know, feeding on a plant, moving to a new plant and feeding on another one, it's not very efficient, quote unquote, but it is very effective, quote unquote. Um, some of the reasons that it's effective is that it's very, very mobile. Um, so you know, it covers long distances, but also because it's such a large insect, it feeds uh, closer to the base of the trunk on the vines. So a lot of the, a lot of native sharpshooters that we have that have been around forever, like blue-green sharpshooter and green sharpshooter, uh, that's kind of what's up in the Napa North Coast area that spread Pierce's disease up there. It tends to feed, uh, it tends to not fly very far, so it stays sort of, you know, near the riparian areas, uh, but it tends to feed out at the tips. So if it feeds at a tip, you get some xylella disease in the vine, and then you prune all the shoots off, you tend to cut the disease out each year. Um, not too bad. Glasswing sharpshooter, to the contrary, will feed really close to the trunk. So when you get an infection of the bacteria in the, the plant, it tends to get to the permanent plant parts of the, of the vine that don't get pruned out much quicker. And so you get um, you know, more disease incidents. So here's a picture on the top right. Uh, this is a, a picture of a xylem vessel. So this is where the water would move up and down the vine. And you can see the bacteria in there uh, just completely clogged it up. So um, yeah, once you got the bacteria, it gets in there, you get more, more and more and more completely clogged up. When the xylem for transporting water can't transport water, think about what sort of symptoms you'd expect. Well, that's why we call it scorches, okay? It looks like the vine's not getting water. Um, so you get leaf scorch of various different types. Uh, there is no cure for any xylella disease um, that, that I'm aware of at this point. So, yeah, just another picture. Um, yeah, actually, that's the same picture on the xylem. Um, you know, this is how it will move up and down. So just uh, so a few pictures here and a little more. So, so xylella fastidiosa is a species of bacteria. But there's really three subspecies that they get broken out into if you talk to the pathologists. Different subspecies cause 
different diseases in different host plants. Okay, so for example, the strain, uh, I'll call it strain of xylella that causes Pierce disease in grapes doesn't go to olives, for example. Um, but the strain of xylella in Costa Rica in coffee, that strain will go to olives and has now been introduced into, into um, Italy. Um, it's causing a big problem there. So, so yeah, lots of these uh, examples, you know, Pierce disease, grapes, um, there's what we call bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, that gets in, several, you know, elms gets in, you know, kinds of metals, uh, trees and shrubs. Um, in New Jersey, there's these native strains that are spread by sharpshooters uh, in lots of northern latitudes, quite, you know, quite parallel to Washington. Um, oleander leaf scorch, sorry about the typo there. Uh, the coffee leaf scorch, that's the one that's jumping to olives. Uh, alfalfa dwarf. Uh, causes stunting, uh, phony peach disease. Uh, so the peaches tend to get small, they, yeah, undersized, they don't ripen correctly. Uh, and there's a strain, uh, it's called citrus variegated chlorosis. Um, if you wonder why orange juice is so expensive, uh, it's because Brazil's been hammered by citrus variegated chlorosis, along with, of course, Asian citrus psyllid and, and uh, greening or wong long bing uh, that's also in Florida. But there's just some all of these pictures, if you want to look at what they have in common, is they all have some sort of scorching type symptoms where water just isn't getting out to the tips of the leaves like it should, and they essentially are burning up. Uh, there's some other symptoms, uh, depending on the, the plant. Um, you, know, you can get different discolorations between the, the buds on shoots. Uh, we call that like intervenal um, chlorosis or um, uh, there's another name for it, I forgot. Uh, wood looks different. Uh, in grapes, there's what we call persistent petioles. Uh, so the leaf blade will actually fall off, but the petiole will stay on the plant, uh, just sticking there, hanging there, poking out. Um, I'm not going to go into all these symptoms because, again, every single crop is a little bit different. I don't want to make this too grape centric because this issue is much more than a grape issue. Uh, but here's just some pictures. Uh, here's a vineyard, a table grape vineyard in Kern County. This is, picture is probably taken about August 15th, right as we're getting to the end of summer. Uh, harvest, uh, we probably, this is actually a flame seedless block, so this was harvest in of July. Um, actually, they, they would be picking this right now if this were still in the ground. Uh, but you can see the brown shoots sticking there, uh, sticking up where the discoloration is occurring. You go up closer, you can see vines that are stunted. Uh, the yellowing, the browning. Close, more close, you can see the um, you know individual leaves have a color to them. Uh, this will change from variety to variety. You know, green varieties versus red varieties will have different amounts of reddening uh, and so on. So you just kind of have to learn. And we we grow a lot of a lot of different table grape varieties in particular, as well as wine grapes. Uh, the county that I'm in uh, has about ninety thousand acres of grapes. Um, so. Um, yeah, the three county, three county areas over 150,000 acres with all the table grape and wine grape varieties and, and raisins spread in there. Um, they all have similarities, but they look all a little different also in their symptomology. Um, here's a, a Google Earth picture of what a table grape vineyard looks like after you have Pierce's disease. And you can see that sort of patchiness. If I zoom in on that, um, you can tell there's primary and secondary spread. So sharpshooter got in, got a vine, and then from that vine, it started vine, you know, going to the neighboring vines, and you can see this sort of clumpy distribution that you'd typically get with a, a primary and then secondary spread of a disease. Here's what this particular vineyard looked like at the end of 2014. Um, basically, chainsawed, pull it out, it's gone. Um, this vineyard right now uh, happens to be an almond orchard. So that's one way to cure Pierce disease is plant almonds or citrus or blueberries or pistachios or some other crop that grows well in the similar climate to where I'm located. Now, Pierce disease control programs. So what do we do to take care of this problem? Um, they're huge, but here's the premise behind them, sort of the, the principle. We know that without the sharpshooters, Pierce disease can't spread, okay? Um, I, 
Now there are native sharpshooters, but native sharpshooters for a hundred years um, weren't that big a deal for Pierce's disease and other xylella diseases, other than on the North Coast, uh, where it's always been a little bit of a problem. Um, but what, you know, most of California, if there's no sharpshooters, the xylella diseases can't spread. They'll kill their host. It's a dead end. Done. Now at the same time, if there's no Pierce's disease or no xylella around, glasswing sharpshooter, we don't care. Um, feeds on the plant, but doesn't really cause any problems to, to any of its host plants. Um, even sometimes in the thousands on a citrus tree, for example, they can tolerate it, not a big deal. But we do know that when you have both the disease and the vector, that we have these nasty epidemics, uh, like the pictures that you can see here. Now, can either be eradicated? No, we're never going to get rid of xylella. We're never going to get rid of sharpshooters where it's established. Exceptions are, you know, Satellite areas, you catch them early, urban. Yes, uh, we have had lots of successful eradications. That can be done. But once it's in commercial agriculture and you know big areas, that's not gonna happen. Um, so what we have to do is we actually have to control both of them. So we have quarantines, um, restrictions on plant movement. So particularly, you know, nurseries, plant materials. Um, there's just serious protocols in place on what has to be done to inspect, monitor, treat, and so on, plant materials that get moved. Um, same thing with fruit. Uh, for example, if you're picking a citrus fruit, um, there's rules about, you know, you have to pack it within the quarantine zone, or you have to go through certain protocols to clear the bulk load to move out of a quarantine zone. Or even it's, if it's outside of a quarantine zone, but you're going to traverse a quarantine zone to then pack it outside a quarantine zone, even then there's regulations on what uh, what has to be done. So lots of those restrictions. Um, we've got lots of GWIST surveys that be, that are done. Uh, CDFA has thousands and thousands of traps uh, around the state. We have government-based area-wide glasswing sharpshooter management programs, particularly where um, there's higher risk. And I'll talk about one of those programs in a second here. Uh, we've got Pierce's disease surveys uh, in some cases. Um, and then other crops, you know, similar surveys, and then roguing programs. Uh, the, once there's an infective vine, we know it's not going to really produce any fruit, so get rid of it and pull it out. Now, the, the sharpshooter surveys, primarily, as I said, it's CDFA that does these. A quarter mile grid is fairly standard. That, that puts a trap on each corner, uh, if you're thinking of a, a typical, a typically oriented, at least where I am, a typically oriented orchard or, or vineyard. Uh, you know, the Central Valley is uh, hundreds of miles long, over 100 miles wide. Um, so we tend to get pretty flat, square uh, agricultural fields. Um, obviously, you have to be a little creative if you're in foothills and winding around streams and, and have odd-shaped orchards. Uh, there's also urban and residential monitoring programs. Typically, those are done through the local ag commissioners. Uh, they just drive around in grids in the cities, put a sharpshooter trap, uh, a sticky trap up in a a crepe myrtle or a citrus or a xylosma or something on the side of the road uh, with a little note of who put it up there and come back in a week and check those out. Now, a cool thing is all the maps, uh, they're publicly available. So this website right here, if you just Google Pierce's Disease Control Program, you're gonna find a lot of resources on Glasswing Sharpshooter and on uh, the Pierce's Disease. Up towards the right, top right, there's a link that says maps. Click on the link for maps. It's gonna bring up a list of counties, pick your county, then it's gonna show you regions within the county and you can literally look at all the trap capture, all these grids every week for the last year or so. Um, this has been done for many years. Uh, once the traps are about a year old, uh, they date off the website, but if historic data, they can provide that for you. It's, it's public information. Uh, you just have to put in a request and ask for it. So uh, pretty cool resource. Uh, it's nice for the farmers down here too, because they can see uh, if you're a great farmer and you got citrus next to you uh, and it's, you know, the spring, you can make a good guess of, of how the sharpshooters overwintered and what might be. Now I'm going to talk about a case study. Um, anyone that's done work with glass and, and Pierce disease has heard of the general field pilot project. Uh, it's fairly famous. Uh, this is in the southeast part of Kern County, and there's this represents about 30 square miles. So it's about 6,000 acres of grapes and citrus. Um, the orange, orange is oranges, purple is grapes, uh, the reddish there is cherries, blue is blueberries, 
and the green is almonds. So with our situation where the citrus and grapes is where they'd like to move back and forth, uh, this area is just a, a, a perfectly wrong design for uh, creating, well, a, a perfect design for creating a problem with glasswing sharpshooter, uh, just because of the way the two are right next to each other. Uh, plus the area gets a little windy, so it's full of windbreaks that are eucalyptus, casuarinas, uh, other plants that, that the sharpshooters love to get into. And, you know, if you want to try to have a problem treating something, try to treat a 60, 70, 80 foot tall eucalyptus tree um, embedded in a citrus orchard. It's a labeling nightmare. It's a coverage nightmare. You know, you got to come in with helicopters, but technically you're not supposed to spray an ornamentals product on an ag crop you're going to harvest. It's just a mess. Um, but this is the case study. And what was really tested here is, you know, if I take all of you back to your grad school days, you know, how many of you took a class where they said, you can't control a disease by controlling its vector? Okay, that's a typical dogma. You know, it only takes one to spread something. I mean, not that it can't help, but it just, it doesn't solve the problem by itself. That was the dogma before this program. Um, and then we realized that's not completely true. Um, in this case, if you want to control the disease, you have to go and the vector, and you have to do it across multiple commodities. Now, grapes cause or citrus doesn't have sharpshooter problems, but it's a great host. So imagine going to a citrus grower and saying, hey, we need you to kill all these sharpshooters and pay for it. The grower is going to say, what is it, what harm is it, harm is it causing me? And you have to say, none. And the citrus grower will say, then why am I going to spend $50, $60, $70 an acre to control something that's not my problem? And that's a tough argument. The answer is um, because you're a good neighbor. And the intervention is the government says, okay, if you're willing to treat, we'll come in and pay for it. So we have these university, or sorry, these USDA area-wide treatment programs that essentially go in and treat the citrus in the winter that's on this map to kill the sharpshooter when it's concentrated there in the winter so that it will not fly into the grapes during the summer. All the treatments are based on maps. So this is what this is typically what you'd see if you go to that website I mentioned with glassing sharpshooter maps. You'll see all these little dots. And you know, really quickly, you can tell if something's treated or not. The organic citrus always jumps out. Um, organic citrus is a nightmare because we don't have any effective tools. Um, but you know, you can see. Um, you know, the, the uh, yellow circles there, yeah, that's six to 10. Um, you know, but at the same time, you can see some of these, some of these traps were catching 10, 20, 30, 40 sharpshooters per trap per week. Uh, most of these are in the one to 10 range, but you can see the distribution. And if you imagine, you know, if I were to overlay that map, you know, back over this one, you can tell those, those sharpshooters are all in that citrus belt. The bottom left there where there's nothing being found, that's the grapes. That'll ch that would change if this map were from a little bit uh, different time of year. Uh, but this general beal area, it's got 470 traps. They've been there since 2001. So um, great data set if you're a researcher that wants to look at things over time. So Pierce disease surveys, my team takes care of these. Uh, we survey every fall right about the time the vines start to senesce. So, you know, as they start to senesce, the symptoms really pop and they're easy to see. Once the vines are fully senescing, then the damage becomes camouflaged with leaves that are naturally turning brown. So August for us is about the best window. Um, yeah, very end of July, August, maybe the first weeks of September is the best time to survey. Um, so we do, we've done this every year for more than a decade. Anything that's symptomatic, we mark the vine and it gets pulled out during the winter through their roguing programs. We monitor the acres that we can, um, 100 to 200,000 vines a year. Then the acreage we can't get to, uh, we train the growers. They have people that go out and survey the rest of it. But here's sort of our history uh, case study for 20 years of what we've seen. So early on, 2001, you can see all the sharpshooters there. That's when we started the area-wide programs, um, insecticide treatments in the grapes and citrus. And you can see for about four years, we had the glory years 
where there was just excellent control. And most of that only got one treatment every two to three years. 2006 to 2008, uh, we're still getting good control, but we had to start making treatments once per year. 2009 to 2011, now you can see that even with a treatment every year, the control was slipping. And then we had this 2012 to 2016, where we had two applications every year, and the sharpshooters just blew up on us. Um, now, we, in hindsight, we now know that was resistance to neonicotinoids. Um, they changed their programs, started using uh, different chemistries, you know, like Savanto, for example, um, pyrethroids in the winter. And you can see from 2017 to 2019, got the numbers back under control. And then over the last three years, uh, we've had this sort of slip where the numbers have increased again. Um, some of that's just because we haven't had as much funding or treatments as previous, uh, but also there's been a significant increase in organic citrus. And we don't have good tools for controlling blossoming sharpshooter and organic citrus. Uh, we've looked, we've tried anything and everything we could think of, and we don't. So, um, so overall, I would say, you know, that 2020 to 2022, in most vineyards and orchards, the numbers look similar to 2017 and 2019. But then if you add in those hotspot organics, the overall numbers are as high as you see there. So that's not even distribution. It's a little tricky to interpret. Now, the question then is, how does that relate to Pierce's disease? So these are the number of vines on the bottom from Pierce disease. And just, you know, just take a look at those for a second. Um, you know, what do you see? Hopefully what jumps out is you see a little, you see a correlation, okay? Correlation between sharpshooters and Pierce disease. But hopefully that lag jumps out at you. So you can see when you got a lot of sharpshooters one year, you get a lot of disease the next year, okay? Fall of the next year. Um, that lag has been consistent throughout. Now, if you look at 2007 to 2011, um, we had a little more of a lag there. We really didn't have any Pierce's disease. And so that six years, the sharpshooters were building up. Uh, we didn't really have an epidemic yet, but then finally the disease sort of got back in there and caught up. And then 2013, um, we were pulling out or you know, vineyard after vineyard after vineyard and you know, complete removal. Um, that bad. So if you look at correlations here, this is, so the x-axis is the number on, on the left side. The x-axis, this is the number of sharpshooters that were caught during a year. And the y-axis is how many Pierce's disease vines you've had. Any correlation? No. Okay. So sharpshooters in 2013, will not be correlated to how many vines are symptomatic in 2013. To the right is the same chart, but with a one-year lag. So now we're looking at how many sharpshooters were caught last year, let's say 2022 on the x-axis, versus how many diseased vines there were in 2023. And there you can see the really nice correlation. This sort of highlights the biggest problem we've got is that we cannot detect and remove through symptomology infected vines in the year they become infected. So inherently, we've got vines that are infected in the summer, asymptomatic in the fall, sitting with the disease all winter, carrying the disease the next summer as sharpshooters are spraying it to new vines. And then after that already occurred, we can see the symptoms, we can mark it, and we can pull it out. That is our frustration. That's why we're having to control both the sharpshooters and the disease because of this asynchrony. We can't get them both out at the same time. So uh, just some general summary here. You know, showing you th that case study is the case in nightmare Pierce area, but is certainly not reflected of the, was it? In acres of grapes, something like that, that we have in California. So, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not reflective of that. Most vineyards are just fine. Pierce disease is not a major issue, but this case study shows that it can be if the sharpshooters get out of control. So, um, yeah, problematic vineyards were on top of them. They tend to get removed and planted to other crops. 
or just removed and replanted. Um, growers in the state are very cooperative. Um, but this, this last point I want to make um, on the last bullet here, since we've been monitoring Pierce's disease in the general Beale uh, area, there have been uh, 70, uh, 70 different vineyards, like physical vineyards monitored. 41 of those are no longer planted to grapes. So I want to say, yes, this is a manageable problem. Yes, it can uh, be solved. At the same time, the fact that half of the vineyards that used to be vineyards are now planted to something else um, just highlights that it's not as simple as I just made it sound um, and that it is an issue. And again, I'm just highlighting grapes. Um, you know, it's not the only crop affected. So, you know, from a practical standpoint, for those of you that are growers, uh, here's kind of what growers do. Uh, survey in the fall, pull the vines out immediately, and assume that you missed some. That's the best you can do. Um, in the winter, this is where we make sure the sharpshooters get controlled anywhere that they're concentrated in the winter, like in the citrus. Um, anytime we treat the citrus, it's very coordinated. Uh, the sharpshooters tend to run in front of the spray rigs. And if you treat one vineyard or, or excuse me, one orchard, they'll just fly to the next one and feed for a week. And they'll fly back to the first one when you treat that one. Um, so uh, very, very coordinated in their treatments. Um, all the growers know their neighbors. Um, and this is also for Asian citrus psyllid, uh, where they actually have districts where, you know, if one person treats, they all treat. Huge industry coordination on this. Uh, it's taken a long time to develop that, but very beneficial. Um, so yeah, remove it in the winter. Then in the spring, we take a look at the heat maps. We look at what's going on in the sharpshooters. Retreat the overwintering host if we need to, to make sure the sharpshooters don't move into the grapes. And then... You know, once the, the movement to grapes starts with that generation in July, um, typically our growers are all applying a neonicotinoid. Uh, that's for vine mealybug, um, as well as glasswing sharpshooter, uh, plus leaf hoppers. So it's kind of three birds with one stone. Uh, so that goes on. Um, grape growers are taking care of themselves there. And then, um, yeah, and that, that's kind of the program. And with that, we manage it. So... Uh, so just general conclusions, this is my last slide here. Um, GWIS inclusion by the state of Washington on the quarantine list, absolutely justified. Um, you have enough host crops um, that, that to expect that it would, you know, be a problem. Um, I put on, uh, however, you know, climate match models, most of your state, it's going to freeze in the winter. Um, interesting point on that. So... Glasswing sharpshooter can actually handle fairly cold weather. What it can't handle is lack of warm weather. I know that sounds a little funny, but it's a, it's a large insect. It has to feed a lot and it desiccates very easily. So what that means is, you know, in the winter, it could be in a citrus tree. We could get down in the mid twenties over a couple of nights. Which, which can be devastating for citrus. I know it doesn't sound like very cold for you guys, but that's, that's cold for us. Um, you know, that'll actually you know, seriously damage a citrus tree. And the sharpshooter will come out of it no problem. Mid-20s at night, hey, as long as it gets back up to 50 the next day, we're good. It feeds in the afternoon, it's happy. But if we get seven straight days of fog where it never gets over the 40s in the afternoon, it's not warm enough for it to feed. It's, it's buckle muscles, you know, in its mouth. It can't suck. And it basically can't drink for a while. It desiccates, dries out, and dies. So, you know, how cold can it tolerate? I don't know. But like I said, for us, it's more so how warm does it get during the day in the winter versus how cold does it get at night? That's an indicator of how well it will survive the winter. Um, so third bullet, how well do you know what xylella strains or subspecies you have in Washington? I don't know. Uh, California, Purcell for his entire career, other Berkeley people, we know it inside and outside, up and down. But I'll tell you, a lot more classic sharpshooter than what we used to know with our native sharpshooters. So keep this pest out because the last thing you want to do is hire you know, have to hire several epidemiologists because you realize that all these xylella strains that are indigenous to Washington that used to be almost non-noticeable are now prolific. 
So um, fourth bullet, yeah, manageable sharpshooters, PD is manageable, um, but the programs are expensive. They require government intervention. Um, the urban areas require um, county ag commissioners, people to knock on doors and ask people to treat their backyards with pesticides. Um, in the Central Valley, we have incredible success rates. People buy in, but you know what? You go to the coast, you go to Santa Cruz, you go to other uh, cities, um, you know, just depending on, let's, let's call it, let's just say the more rural, the more acceptance, the more urban, the less acceptance of people coming in and spraying your backyard with pesticides. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Um, but because of that, we do have regional differences in, in how well people will, will accept. Um, and if you're in a downtown city where you get poor acceptance, that's where the parasitoid release programs come in and have to be the focus. So we continue to push it back. We continue to look for satellite populations, continue to eradicate those wherever we can. Um, and then just lastly, if there's one thing you guys have got going for you, we've got 20 years of experience and incredible resources if you want to know what it looks like, if you want to know molecular markers for the disease, I mean, anything and everything you want, just make a phone call to California. We've probably got a brochure for it, half dozen or more publications for it. We've got people that can answer your questions and would love to help you do that. Um, that currently happens all over the world. Um, for example, when the coffee xylella got to olives in, great, it, olives in Italy, they all freaked out because it was xylella. They knew xylella is caused by um, is what causes Pierce disease, and instantly Italy thought they were going to lose all their grapevines. Well, Californians went out there and said, actually, this is a strain that we don't have in California, so you didn't get it from us. Please keep it in Italy. We don't want it. And turns out it was spread by coffee plants that were brought from Costa Rica to an expo in Italy to use as ornamentals at a, in like a big expo, whatever. Um, from there, their native sharpshooters um, spread it out into the olives. And yeah, we don't want it in California. So, uh, but again, the California people were were just integrated in all of those. Um, you know, we're, I want to say we're, I want to say we're who you call. If you want to know about management on the ground stuff, call me. But likewise, if you want to know about trapping disease and all that, we got people that are experts in all that. Uh, please tap into us. Uh, we, we'd love to help you out. And then the last set of advice is be friends with Northern California and be friends with Oregon. So you've got a state and a half buffer. Keep it as a buffer. Uh, don't let it creep up on you. And we'll do our best to keep what we got within our own state. So with that, thanks, uh, thanks Jen and, and others for, uh, for the invitation. Hopefully that gave you an idea of what we're dealing with and uh, something to watch out for.